Hello, I'm Patrick Cronin, and welcome to this Hudson Institute event on the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy. The Indo-Pacific has grown in importance in recent decades, and today accounts for half the world's population and two-thirds of global economic growth. Since the end of the Cold War, U.S. administrations have been issuing regional strategy documents about the Indo-Pacific, as we now term it, and it's risen in prominence, especially since the Obama administration, in the Trump administration, and now with the Biden administration's release of a new vision for the Indo-Pacific. Um, and we're delighted today to be joined by one of the key architects of that strategy, Edgar Kagan, Senior Director for East Asia and Oceania at the National Security Council. And we're honored to have with us as well, a distinguished panel with US retired Lieutenant General, Dr. H.R. McMaster, former National Security Advisor, and here at Hudson, the Japan Chair. Um, also former OSD official and RAND analyst, Dr. Bonnie Lin, who is now director of the China Power Project and senior fellow for Asian security at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. And last but not least, Lisa Curtis, former senior director for South and Central Asia at the National Security Council during the Trump administration, and now director for the Indo-Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security, CNAS. Welcome all. In this brief hour long program, we want to discuss the new strategy and what it means going forward. We recognize that we're discussing this amid the conflict over Ukraine, uh, which is creating human tragedy and reshaping world affairs. We want to consider what the war means for the Indo Pacific strategy. But before we do that, let's make sure we know what is in the strategy and what it means for the region. And let me first turn to Edgar Kagan a career foreign service officer who has served or had responsibilities for all corners of the Indo-Pacific region to highlight a few key elements of the strategy. Edgar, over to you, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Patrick, um, and thank you for your introduction, but more importantly for hosting this and arranging it. I think it's very timely, and it's also great to see uh, former uh, colleagues, um, and you know, it's tremendous to see Lisa Curtis, who I had the great pleasure of working with very closely on serving in India. I'm used to actually doing exactly what she tells me when she tells me to do it. So it's a little intimidating. And then obviously, you know, I used to get the, those things used to be passed from General McMaster through her. Uh, so it's great to see everyone here. And it's great to see Bonnie. I think a number of things. I think, first of all, you mentioned, and something we're very conscious of, there's a number of administrations. I and mean, as a matter of fact, all of the last five administrations have done some form of this. Um, and I think as we worked on this, we were extremely conscious of the importance of identifying areas of continuity, uh, as well as areas where the situation has changed. And I think the things that to us were very significant is that the U.S. is an Indo-Pacific nation, and we have long been engaged in the region. I think it was very important from our standpoint to affirmatively lay out what is our vision for the region that we've so long been part of? But it was also important to identify what has changed. And I think that we all have to acknowledge that there are some very significant changes in the region. The strategic situation in the region has changed uh, is a function of a variety of things. I mean, one is greater prosperity and greater strength in the region. Also, obviously, the rise of China and China's behavior the pressures caused by the pandemic and the sense that, you know, frankly, this is not going to be the last time that we have a pandemic and that we need to, as we try and deal with this one, we also need to prepare for the next one. And the, the, the tremendous challenges caused by climate change. And so we felt it was important to identify the, I think, consistent themes that are very much part of how the United States looks at the Indo-Pacific region. And I would note, and a tip of the hat to uh, General McMaster and to Lisa, because we made a very conscious decision at the beginning of the Biden administration to adopt the term Indo-Pacific, uh, because we felt that this really did better capture um, how we look at the region and how we see the region developing. Uh, but we thought that it was very important to identify what is the, the areas of continuity, also areas of change, and to highlight what we see as sort of the critical issues for the region. And I think that, you know, we, we have sort of five pillars, um, which I think you would, you know, are, are pretty consistent with the possible exception of climate change, pretty consistent 
across the policies that you've seen for previous administration. I mean, you can argue about how they're racked and stacked, but the reality is that there's tremendous continuity in those areas. I think that where we see difference, certainly where I see difference, is the recognition that our greatest asset is our network of alliances and partnerships. And that the changes in the strategic situation in the region make very clear that in order to be effective, we need to work more closely with our allies and our partners. And we need to build on this. And that the you know sort of days in which we could operate without as much regard to bringing groups together and co cooperating with our key allies and partners, those days are gone. And so I think that, you know, that one of the advantages, so when we were asked, like, why didn't you do this on day one or day two or day whatever the administration? I mean, part of the reason is that, you know, I don't take a lot of administrations have managed to get something like this out in their first month or so, but also because we wanted to listen to what we heard in the region and we wanted to build a bit of a track record. I think that what I would identify as one of the very consistent themes is the importance of affirmative U.S. engagement. That you know, people do not want to hear, people across the region do not want to hear about what we're against. They want to hear about what we're for. And that this has been one of the historical strengths of how the United States has engaged in the region. That we have had a vision, we've worked to implement it, we've tried to work with others. I think that those are key themes for us. So just to very quickly, the five pillars are advanced freedom and openness, which we do believe is critical for the region and something that establishes that the U.S. wants to work with our partners and our allies in the region, uh, building collective capacity within and beyond the region, promoting shared prosperity, bolstering Indo-Pacific security, and building regional resilience. And for us, these things are very much part and parcel of what the U.S. has historically done. I think that what we see as the key things that we're trying to also do is to recognize that the strategic changes in the region require us to look at the region and our policy in different ways. And so you can see one of those is the quad. And I would note that we just had this morning another leader level virtual quad meeting, um, which I think reflects the fact that the quad as is evolving, I want to give it a, a recognition of the fact that, you know, the quad did not begin in this administration. This administration built on the very capable work and important progress that was done in the previous administration. And the idea of the quad goes back to uh, the George H.W. Bush administration. Um, but the, the idea that the quad is evolving into a mechanism that isn't just about delivering public goods for the region, but also is a mechanism that leaders use to coordinate in response to events and emerging situations, as well as to make sure that we remain coordinated in our approach to how we work in the Indo-Pacific. But also you've seen AUKUS, which I think is a response to our recognition that we need to address some of the strategic challenges and restore some level of deterrence in the region. Um, and that we've also seen it, we, uh, a real effort on our part to step up the relationship with ASEAN. Um, and you, know, you saw Secretary Blinken, I would note where he rolled out the Indo-Pacific strategy in Fiji at a meeting of the Pacific Islands Forum. And so recognition that we also need to be working with our friends and partners in the Pacific. And then obviously, I think there's a, an emphasis on strengthening the relationship with India and making sure that when we think of the Indo-Pacific, we really are focused on the Indo, not just the Pacific. The other, last thing I would note is that the other thing that we're doing, and I recognize that it's coming a little bit slow, more slowly than some would like, is rolling out an affirmative economic agenda to engage with the region, which reflects both what we heard but, and, ref, and what we've laid out here, but also reflects the recognition that this is part of having an affirmative vision for the region. So I don't want to bore everyone, um, and you know, you've got much smarter people than me um, to hear from, but I think that those at least gives you some of the sense of how we looked at this and what we see is really critical. Um, in terms of building on what has happened, recognizing the changes, and making sure that we have a durable, and frankly, from our standpoint, bipartisan strategy going forward that builds on the fact that there is a very broad consensus in the United States um, that, that transcends the administration, that goes to Capitol Hill and elsewhere, 
on the importance of U.S. engagement. While there may be differences on exactly how that's done, our view is we want it to build on where on as much of the agreement as possible so that we have something which addresses, I think, one of the real concerns in the region, which is the durability and sustainability of the U.S. role. So with that, let me pass it back to you, Patrick. Mayor Edgar, thank you so much. I mean, I think our competitors and adversaries overseas maybe do underestimate the extent to which we are in agreement and there's bipartisan support. But let me let me ask H.R. McMaster that very question and, and what he thinks about this strategy and how it uh, is rooted in the past and his own experience. Well, Edgar, thanks for being with us and and uh, and for that great summary. I just really applaud the effort to to get the strategy out, which I know is not easy, and to to coordinate across our own government, let alone with our with our with our uh, friends and partners in, in in the region. Hey, I see tremendous continuity with the approach that the Trump administration took, and and Edgar, you led with obviously the importance of working, you know, with partners and allies and uh, in in the region, and that was line of effort one, you know, in the in the Specific strategy in the Trump administration as well, and and of course, um, I think that uh, that that really the the main element of continuity is the recognition that the stakes are very high these days, especially because of the aggression of the Chinese Communist Party and its actions in the in the region, and and I think that there's a tremendous opportunity to strengthen. Uh, cooperation in the region, thanks to Xi Jinping. I mean, I think we should maybe send him flowers and a box of chocolates, and and, uh, and because I think what he's done is he's shown our, who are our, our allies and partners in the region who are oftentimes reluctant to take a firm stance on China, uh, and and often then communicate to us, hey, don't make us choose, please, don't make us choose between Washington and Beijing. I think increasingly they're recognizing hey, it's not a choice between Washington and Beijing that they face. It's a choice between between sovereignty and servitude. And I think the the positive aspect of the strategy that you highlighted, Edgar, is also immensely important. That's why you know, we had the free and open Indo-Pacific language, right? Because it stands in implicit, uh, but yet but stark contrast uh, with the authoritarian mercantilist model that that China is promoting across the region. So I, you know, I I applaud you for it. I think that there there are many more continuities than there are uh, any differences, certainly between the the Trump administration approach and your approach. And heck, it ought to be that way in foreign policy, shouldn't it? <laughs> right. You know, so I so I I think it's a it's a really positive sign uh, for also our ability to implement kind of a sustained, sustainable, long term approach to the to these long term problems and challenges and, and opportunities that we're facing. H.R., thanks so much. I want to turn to Bonnie and just get a sense of how she thinks China's responding to this and how China's characterizing this report. And I'll just read one sentence in this critical paragraph five of this fairly concise strategy document. Um, The PRC is combining its economic, diplomatic, military, and technological might as it pursues a sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific and seeks to become the world's most influential power. I think I read that in the Trump administration's national security strategy. So I know there's a lot of continuity there. But Bonnie, seriously, how how do you think this characterization of China fits right now with especially Beijing's uh, confidence and and appearance of of its uh, rise on the stage here? Well, thank you, Patrick. I'm really delighted to be here. And building on what General McMaster said, I, I really think this strategy is excellent. It's clear. It's also a pragmatic document. Uh, so Patrick, you re- you read that portion about its characterization of China. What also stood out to me in the strategy was a line of, that basically underlines the core of the strategy. And the core of the strategy is not to change China, right? But it's to change, it's to shape the strategic environment in which China operates it. And I think that's a very pragmatic and realistic assessment. I think any strategy that started with the premise that we can change China is probably way too optimistic in its approach. Um, in terms of how I look at the strategy generally, uh, as well as uh, how it's being received in China. So one uh, element that has been picked up again and again is, and Edgar pre, uh, hinted at this already, which is the um, economic component of the strategy. So strategy lays out that there will be a focus on the Indo-Pacific economic framework, but we haven't seen that uh, uh, published yet. So there's a lot to be seen on the economic front. And I think what our allies and partners will be looking at is, will the framework be robust enough to decrease their economic dependency on China? And and would it be uh, robust enough to uh, also decrease China's economic leverage on our key allies and partners? Uh, A point that uh, Chinese strategists have picked out in terms of the strategy is that it's very 
comprehensive and some of the new elements, for example, the focus on climate change is likely to appeal to additional U.S. allies and partners in the Pacific, particularly the Pacific Island countries who climate change matters quite a bit to. So that has been a line that I've heard uh, Chinese strategists talk about with respect to the Indo-Pacific strategy. At the same time, uh, and some of the concerns I have with the strategy is that it is, because it's so comprehensive, I do wonder to what extent um, are we, uh, are we is, it, is it offering too much? Is it covering too much ground? So one line that I see in the strategy that's in interesting is the line under the part of bolstering Indo-Pacific security, where it says that, quote, we'll, the United States will more tightly integrate our efforts across warfighting domains and spectrum of conflict to ensure that the United States, alongside our allies and partners, can dissuade or defeat aggression in any form or domain. This reads to me as the US signing up to help our allies and partners to counter any and all forms of aggression. So I think there's a larger discussion to be had on what roles should our allies and partners play versus what roles should the United States play. But uh, in general, there, there's just so much in the strategy that we uh, can spend the next hour or so unpacking. We can, and I, I'm going to want to also bring in the very disruptive uh, world event of, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine here momentarily. But first, let's hear from Lisa about her views on the strategy, but in particular, the Indo part of this in India and whether, uh, you know, how that fits in. You've been credited by Edgar uh, Kagan and the administration for uh, having developed uh, the Quad, um, having, you know, further developed this and, and brought India closer into alignment. So Lisa, how do you see India's role in our current strategy going forward? Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here, Patrick. Um, and, you know, I think that the overall strategy, I think General McMaster was correct that there's a lot of similarities in the overall themes and thrust of the strategy. I would say that the, um, the Biden Indo-Pacific strategy probably is a natural progression of the strategic framework that the Trump administration had laid out. Let's remember it was written four years ago. Um, and so the, the Biden Indo-Pacific strategy gets deeper in the details and kind of fleshes out areas like um, increasing cooperation on uh, critical and emerging technologies. And of course, deepens the discussion on the quad. And as you said, uh, the quad was revived uh, by the Trump administration in the fall of 2017. Uh, there was a lot of momentum uh, during the Trump years on the Quad, but of course the Biden administration has kind of taken it to the next level. Um, but with regard to India, um, I think that both, both the Trump strategy and the Biden strategy were very clear about the value that the U.S. places on India's role in the Indo-Pacific and that um, both administrations really looking to India to increase its engagement in the Indo-Pacific to help offset growing Chinese influence and power. It's very clear. The Biden administration recognizes India as quote unquote, a driving force for the quad, an engine for regional growth and development. Um, and in India certainly, um, uh, has been receptive to that role. India has been doing more, looking east, uh, look at the most recent visit by the Indian foreign minister to the Philippines, increasing their defense ties. So we certainly see India uh, starting to play more of a role in this important region. But I do wanna point out, uh, I am concerned that India's failure to take a position on Russia's invasion of Ukraine could cast a shadow on how its role in the Indo-Pacific is viewed. Um, countries in the region may question whether India uh, will stand up for uh, territorial sovereignty of other nations, um, given that it has soft-pedaled its response to Russia's invasion of um, Ukraine. So I think that we, we just need to keep that in mind. Uh, India, of course, has had a longstanding military relationship with Russia. Um, it, you know, seeks to drive a wedge between Russia and China um, because of its own disputes with China. But I think if India is hoping that by supporting Russia, 
that it will sort of uh, get a reprieve from China on its own borders. I think it may be mistaken because Russia is only going to grow more dependent on China as the Western sanctions bear down on its economy. And so, you know, uh, Moscow is not going to be able to uh, dictate the terms of that partnership. Uh, so I do think that um, this has uh, put a bit of a concern, a bit of a shadow on uh, India's role in the Indo-Pacific. Yes, and, and maybe we saw that in, in Melbourne uh, when Secretary Blinken was there, Edgar, um, because the Quad foreign ministers were meeting. And um, it, it was then that the Indian uh, minister uh, was kind of reluctant to, to talk about um, the Quad uh, dealing with, uh, with Russia and, and Russian aggression, but wanted to keep it positive what, what the Quad stood for. So while I don't want to turn away from the Indo-Pacific strategy, I would like this round of questions maybe to focus a bit on how Ukraine and Russia's aggression has changed that or what, what it means for the Indo-Pacific strategy. And on the positive side there, Edgar, as, as we turn to you, uh, it's very clear that other uh, U.S. allies in the region have been at the, forth, you know, at the forefront. Uh, Japan in particular, I think, has surprised a lot of people by signing on to international sanctions, just as our, uh, our European allies have, have brought on uh, thanks to U.S. leadership in part, um, neutral countries, uh, you know, providing assistance and arms and support for sanctions. So there's been tremendous international support, yet, as Lisa mentions, um, our, our big democracy uh, friend in, in you know, India has been disappointingly slow uh, to take up this call. But Edgar, how has, in your mind, you know, what is the, what is the chief implication of Russia's uh, aggression against Ukraine for the Indo-Pacific strategy from, from your perspective? Look, thank you. Um, and thanks very much for the comments. Um, and, you know, I'll try not to let the, pray, the rare praise go to our heads. Um, I think that the, uh, a couple of things. I think, first of all, it should be noted, we released the strategy on the eve of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and at a time when there was tremendous focus on um, the on Ukraine, and I think that one of the real questions that exists in the region is essentially, can we sustain focus on the region in the face of challenges elsewhere? And to some degree, this was an issue for the Obama administration when they did the pivot slash rebalance to Asia. This was also an issue for the Trump administration. I think it's very clear that there's been a recognition in the United States of the importance of the region for some time. The problem, as is always the case, is you know sustaining the engagement, sustaining the focus. And I think that there are questions on it. So ultimately, we can say whatever we want now, but I think what people will judge us on is what we do. I think the first thing is that we did get this uh, strategy out. Um, Secretary Blinken did travel to Australia for a meeting with the, the Quad, and then um, Fiji for a meeting with the Pacific Islands Forum. He was the first U.S. Secretary of State to go to Fiji in 36 years. We've got to go back to George Schultz the last time we did this. And I think that's not insignificant at a time when, you know, everyone knows the pressures that are, that are placed on the senior officials and administration. At that time, to go there, I think, sent, sent a strong signal. And then he went to Hawaii to me, in a, for a more traditional thing of doing a trilateral with the Koreans and the Japanese. I think that's been noticed. And the fact that we did the quad uh, leaders call uh, a virtual meeting today, I think is a reflection of the fact that we recognize the need to do exactly what you said, which is that one of the real changes in the region, that's something that I think is different from the Obama administration and the Trump administration, is there's much more interest in Europe in the Indo-Pacific, one of the things that's a feature of the Indo-Pacific strategy that the Biden administration released is focusing on how we work with others, with outside partners, to coordinate our approaches to the Indo-Pacific. And I think that's something that's very important. But what, as you also said, and it's not just Japan, I mean, the ROK, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore have joined up on sanctions, they've issued statements. Um, the number of them are committing humanitarian assistance. Australia is sending lethal assistance. I mean, these are very, very significant developments that reflect, I think, the idea that the traditional division between this is Europe, this is 
Asia or Indo-Pacific. And, you know, maybe there's a little bit of international between the two. That's gone. And I think what we're seeing is the, the fact that our relationships and our alliances and partnerships in the Indo-Pacific are actually materially significant to a crisis in Europe. Um, right now, I think that sends a powerful message because, you know, the Europeans themselves are obviously aware of this. And at the same time, I think that what we're seeing is a recognition that the rules that people may have assumed still apply don't. And that, that, is, that sends a very powerful message in the region. And I think that we're seeing China is uncomfortable um, with the position that it's taken. There, there is obviously a huge difference between saying we always support sovereignty and territorial integrity, except maybe in this case. Uh, and I think that that's something that has an impact. And look, my prediction is you're not going to see a lot of countries in the region cutting their defense budgets in the coming year. I would also note that just with regard to the point about India, I think it's a very real point. But, you know, and Lisa knows this uh, painfully well, it took us a long time before we got a joint statement. As a matter of fact, the, uh, from the Quad, the foreign ministers meeting in Melbourne uh, uh, last month, that was the first joint statement from a foreign ministers meeting. Um, that, uh, I mean, it was the third meeting of the foreign ministers, the second in person, or the second standalone uh, meeting. Uh, I guess there was also a virtual meeting. So the fourth meeting, third in person, second standalone, but first one of the joint statement. We've now had three joint statements out of leaders' meetings of the Quad. And, you know, I leave it to, to Lisa and others, General McMaster, others who've been involved with this. This is a significant development. I think it shows a recognition by all parties to the Quad that we are better when we stand together. And I think that where India is on this, I think you obviously have to ask the Indians for their assessment of their own strategic interests. But I think that the broader point about the implications of what Russia is doing, as well as of the Russian-Chinese cooperation, and they're saying that there's no limits to their partnership, I don't think that that is missed on many people who occupy positions of importance in India. So my view is that, you know, the things that we've done are built on a real foundation, of real interests, a real recognition on the part of partners that has been built over time, that has been built by, you know, previous administrations. So I think General McMaster's point about the fact that ultimately one of the things that's important in our line of business is not to mistake luck for skill. And ultimately, you know, China's actions have been in many ways one of the most important driving forces to bring the kind of consensus that we're seeing. But the, the key thing to me is finding ways in which we can keep working together, finding ways in which we can keep delivering on an affirmative vision that addresses real concerns the countries in the region has that have in a way that is respectful, that makes clear that we respect their sovereignty, their right to choose, territorial integrity, um, and that we are looking to work as partners and as allies, not impose ourselves uh, and not try and push them into areas that they don't want to go. And look, we are very clear. We are not asking countries to choose. On the other hand, we want to make sure the countries have a choice. And that very much reflects what we have heard consistently from virtually every single country in the region, that they don't want to be forced to choose, but they want a choice. They welcome U.S. engagement, want to see more of it. They want to see it be bipartisan. They want to see what we can do together because they are concerned about the sustainability. And that the opportunities that we get from coming together with our key partners inside the region and outside uh, are very significant and are making a real difference. And Edgar, we want to hear more about what might be coming up on the Indo-Pacific agenda, including the special summit with ASEAN and other events this year. But I want to stay on this theme of Russia's aggression against Ukraine and its strategic implications. I want to turn back to General McMaster HR and ask him, I mean, you saw this coming in so many ways, but the world is really awakened to a kind of a different view. What what are the big strategic implications in your mind of this of this current war? Well, I think, number one, we can't just focus on one problem at a time. And I think it's really been our tendency to try to compartmentalize the competition with Russia and the competition with China, the competition with Iran, the competition with North Korea, or the competition with jihadist uh, terrorist organizations. We have to recognize that our adversaries will act, if not in concert, but at least in a way that allows them to take advantage of a crisis in one area to advance their interests in another. These two authoritarian regimes, revisionist powers on the Eurasian landmass, are cooperating with one another. They are 
de facto allies as much as we want to drive a, a wedge b- between them and as much as we can maybe be encouraged by Chinese disinformation to portray themselves as peacemakers China is part of the problem that we're seeing in Ukraine and we saw that with the joint statement the the 5000 word statement that was that was issued between uh, Putin and Xi Jinping you know they're they're dear the the, the dear friends <laughs> and uh uh, and is saying there are no limits to their cooperation and so forth. That was clearly a precursor to the invasion of Ukraine, as well as the phone call, you know, between Xi Jinping and and Putin on, on the eve of of the invasion. And so I think we have to recognize that our competition across the Indo-Pacific is not just in that geographic region. And obviously, developments and aspects of of of, of uh, national security and and foreign policy competitions that occur outside the Indo-Pacific affect that region and affect the competition with China. And I think just for an example, we ought to be able to, and I think you can, everybody can see it. There's a direct line between, I think, the surrender to a jihadist terrorist organization and the humiliating retreat from Afghanistan uh, to the invasion of Ukraine and and, and to other various forms of, of aggression of the Chinese Communist Party. I believe that because of that humiliating withdrawal and surrender in Afghanistan, Xi Jinping and Putin concluded that our will to confront them was just about zero. And so if you look at deterrence as capability times will, they assumed that it was zero. And they were basing that on, I think, also the traumas that we've seen in our own society, vitriolic partisanship uh, in, 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 our, in our society, the, the, uh, you know, the divisiveness that, that, is, that is apparent to, those, to outsiders who look at us, but also divisions in our alliances and and differences between us and our European allies. And and I think Putin thought that he was going to get out of this invasion division, division in our own country, division with our allies. Hey, the good news is what he got was was unity, I think. And I think we ought to credit the Biden administration for this. And what we need to do now is portray greater strength and to recognize that our policies and actions in other areas affect this competition. I'll give you just one other example. Why did the Emiratis, why did they not, uh, why did they not vote in, in, in our favor against Russia uh, as, a, as, a te- as a rotating member of the Security Council? The reason is our supplication to the Iranians you know, and, and, their, and, their, and their concerns that we will not designate the Houthis who are firing missiles into their territory as a terrorist organization. So I think our, our, our profession of desire to withdraw from the Middle East, for example, doesn't help us in the competition in the Indo-Pacific because, of course, it creates opportunities uh, for, for Russia and, and I think especially for China to fill that vacuum. So I think what we need is a sustained, rational approach uh, that, that, that goes far beyond the Indo-Pacific and recognizes the connections between these competitions. And, uh, and so I hope that that's what we have. I think there are some of those who have been arguing, hey, you know, why are we worried about Russia? You know, let's get out of the middle. Let's pivot, you know, out of the Middle East or out of South Asia, because that'll really help us in the competition with China. Actually, it's the worst thing that we could do. Um, excellent, uh, HR. Bonnie, I want to turn back to you and, and ask a little bit about your thinking about China's calculus here and Xi Jinping's calculus, maybe both that uh, now ill-fated for February joint statement with Vladimir Putin talking about the no limits entente. Um, you know, what was he thinking and what is he thinking now in particular? That's really the question that people want to ask. As one editorial headline put it, you know, what did she know and, and you know, and when did he know it? But I'm I'm still more interested in where will she go uh, from here because he obviously wants it uh, always. Um, he doesn't want to he doesn't want to jettison his strategic partner, but he doesn't want to upset his economic and political interests if he can help it. Um, but he can't really have it both ways. So so where's where's China going to go on this? Thank you, Patrick. A lot of really tough questions. Uh, let me just comment a little bit. So on the February fourth statement. There was the a line about no limits. But what we saw after Russia invaded Ukraine was starting on February 28th, the Chinese foreign ministry again began to recycle some of the limits that were previously on the China-Russia relationship. So in the February 28th Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson statement, again, we saw China recycling the phrase, no alliance, no conflict, and no targeting of any third country as a characterization of the China-Russia relationship. That phrase was dropped for quite some time after the February 4th meeting between Xi and Putin, but is now 
re-entering again Chinese official discourse. So I see this as a sign that China is wary of what's happening in Ukraine, but um, and China is trying to uh, put some distance between where it's where it is now and where Russia, what Russia is doing. We also see, saw that China, uh, with respect to talking about Russian activities in Ukraine, ha- is now characterizing it as a conflict, whereas before China was characterizing it as a special military operation, more or less uh, reiterating Russian talking points. But I think you know these are still only small changes on China's end. Uh, looking at the large picture, I generally agree with what uh, General McMaster said that we should really uh, look at the possibility of uh, moving into the future that uh, we will have a strong, potentially stronger China-Russia relationship. And I want to go back to a point that uh, Lisa made, which is a very critically important, which is as the West imposes more sanctions on Russia, it's likely that Russia will be more dependent on China, which will give China leverage. So how does China think about uh, its future with Russia as well as its relationship with the United States? Uh, so when I li- look at the China-Russia relationship, it's not, um, it's not guaranteed, for example, that the relationship will strengthen. It's possible that, for example, if Putin continues to escalate the conflict in Ukraine, and the sanctions and other uh, retaliation has a significant impact on the Russian economy that China could come to view Russia as a significant more liability than an asset. So I don't think that relation is predestined to necessarily always strengthen. It really depends on how Russia uh, responds. On the flip side, uh, part of China's calculus is also its relationship with the United States. And what we saw, what we're seeing early this year is an assessment by China that the U.S.-China relationship is becoming, is venturing into more negative territory. We saw a statement from Wang Yi earlier this week, um, which he based, uh, which is on the 50th anniversary of the Shanghai communique, which he said, quote, the China-U.S. relationship is facing daunting challenges rarely seen since the establishment of diplomatic ties. And he also warned in that uh, speech that since the door of China-U.S. relations has been opened, should not be closed again. So we're we're seeing a lot of statements early in 2022 that shows that China is, you know, moving closer to Russia, but also we're having seen more and more concerns with uh, how the United States is viewing China. And I think there are probably some analysts in China wondering, you know, given the growing perception in the West and the United States that China-Russia is forming an axis despite the fact that China is trying to argue the opposite, is there anything that China can do to make the U.S.-China relationship better? And I'm not seeing that the Chinese analysts are finding much. And some are making the argument that, well, if the United States already views China as allied with the Russians and there's no way that we can improve the relationship, why shouldn't we form closer ties with Russia? So I think there's a lot to unpack there, but I would just say the China-Russia relationship is quite dependent on the dynamics between China-Russia, but also very much on the U.S.-China relationship moving forward. And Lisa, let me turn to you for some brief thoughts on the kind of nexus of the withdrawal from Afghanistan and and what uh, happens in Ukraine now and its implications for our Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, I mean, I, I agree with uh, General McMaster that um, our adversaries and competitors have misread our political will. Um, but you could still make the case that the withdrawal from Afghanistan was maybe uh, a step toward boosting uh, our efforts in the Indo-Pacific, as well as staying in Europe and staying in the Middle East. I don't mean getting out of anywhere, um, but it, but that's you know water under the bridge now. Um, the miscalculation has occurred. Russia's gone into Ukraine, uh, and now we can't afford for us to look weak in the face of naked aggression in Ukraine collectively without us hurting our relations uh, across the Indo-Pacific. But that's my view. What do you think? Well, I I agree. I think that the uh, President Biden's decision to abruptly withdraw from Afghanistan, uh, along with the chaotic evacuations, and frankly, some of his callous remarks about Afghan security forces that we had been partnering with for 20 years, Um, all have uh, done some permanent damage uh, and and stained his foreign policy record. And I don't think it's going to be easy for him to overcome that. Um, President Biden seems to want to completely close the book on Afghanistan, but the growing humanitarian crisis, the fact that the Taliban is not upholding uh, women's and girls' rights, 
um, I think will compel the United States uh, to have to remain engaged in, in some way, even if we don't have uh, troops on the ground. And I think General McMaster spelled out the global impact of the U.S. withdrawal quite well. Uh, the U.S. Um, looked weak, incompetent, and unreliable. And, you know, we may never know if there was a one for one, but I think a lot of people are assuming that this played into Putin's calculations for his invasion of Ukraine. Um, so I think that in terms of um, the global, uh, the U.S.'s global reputation, the damage has been done. Uh, now, the Biden administration uh, has done some positive things since the withdrawal. Uh, continuing to send humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan is absolutely necessary. Finding ways to get that assistance to the people in need, uh, you know, without having it uh, bolster the Taliban has been something that I think the administration is, is wor working hard on. The fact that they've appointed um, a special envoy for Afghan women, girls, and human rights is important. Somebody to continue to advocate and uh, hold the Taliban accountable on upholding rights of women and girls. Uh, so, you know, there have been some, some good steps since August, but again, the, the damage is really done for the, the way the withdrawal was handled. Um, and I, I also want to reiterate something uh, General McMaster uh, said, you know, we, we have to be able to walk and chew gum. You know, some people are arguing uh, that the focus um, and resources should all be on the Indo-Pacific, let the Europeans handle their own security. Um, that's just not going to be possible or desirable in, in any way. Uh, the Indo-Pacific and China may be the priority, but as a global power, we have to be able to engage in multiple regions at the same time. And you know, hopefully that, that lesson was learned with Afghanistan, because as you said, um, Patrick, that, you know, the argument was uh, we're going to pull out of Afghanistan because we need to focus more attention on the Indo-Pacific. But that is a false choice. And China knows how to take advantage of uh, the places where we are weak or where we are not focusing. So hopefully that was a lesson learned. And we'll, you know, figure out ways to better leverage our relationships with our allies and partners in Europe when it comes to countering Russia, and then leverage our partnerships and alliances in Asia when it comes to countering China, because we, we simply have to be able uh, to do both, because Russia and China really are uh, the same, they're different sides of the same ideological coin. They're both authoritarian regimes who are seeking to rewrite the global rules in their own favor. Edgar, I know you and your colleagues know full well that we're a global power with global responsibilities and, and people like Kurt Campbell uh, as well, uh, the coordinator for uh, Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific Affairs at the White House understands this well. I wanna go back to your focus on the Indo-Pacific though um, and uh, drill down a little bit in one of the key areas that you highlighted and that's in your in the 10 point action plan that comes at the end of this Indo-Pacific strategy and that's reinforcing deterrence. Um, and that's deterrence maybe to stop uh, aggression against Taiwan, uh, to stop uh, North Korean aggression uh, or other aggression in the Indo-Pacific. Um, you know, where we are right now in March of 2022 going forward, you know, how do you see, you, you've mentioned AUKUS as being a key and I've heard some People outside, critics question whether this is going to happen, but I see a lot of activity going on. Other ways that which the Defense Department and the administration's working on integrated deterrence with allies and partners. How can, what, what do you have to say about how the administration can help implement uh, stronger deterrence in the Indo-Pacific from here on out? Thank you very much. And look, I think that it's a, exactly the right question. I would just start off by saying that I think that there is a clear recognition of the importance of a global view of U.S. power and U.S. engagement in the administration. And obviously, there were consequences that flowed from the decision to delay the Trump administration's uh, departure date from Afghanistan. 
and the, the policy that the Trump administration implemented um, with regard to uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And I think that it's very clear that there were some there were consequences. But at the same time, I think that it's very important to recognize that you know, the administration very much understands that U.S. power is not divided by region. I'll get back to what I said earlier the importance of working with our Asian and Indo-Pacific allies and partners to support um, what we're trying to do in Ukraine and what is an incredibly valiant stand of the Ukrainians um, and the importance of reinforcing global unity as well as the power of globalizing sanctions um, and other efforts. So I think that there is that recognition. I think that as it goes to deterrence, I think there's a couple of one is there's the obvious military, you know, more traditional military security component. Uh, and, you know, there's a very significant effort underway to look closely at how we are engaged and, and you know, transition to what uh, Secretary of Defense refers to as integrated deterrence, which is much more coordination with our allies and partners and across the different domains, fully utilizing all of our resources in a more efficient way. But I think it's also important to recognize that we want to reinforce in a number of areas. So it is not just military, it is finding ways of bringing countries together to establish their positions on key issues. And I think that, again, what's happening in Ukraine is one example that in my view helps reinforce deterrence in the Indo-Pacific by showing a global response and global unity that is, I think, quite quite powerful and frankly a little surprising for many in the region. I think that finding ways to establish, for instance, better cooperation outside of the purely military realm of security in dealing with, um, you know, I think there's a lot of issues where we see the Coast Guard as playing a very important role and offering a tremendous potential, and that's one of the elements you see in the strategy. Working with countries that are facing challenges on IU fishing, uh, where, you know, particularly in the Pacific, that's an incredibly important issue, but an issue also where these are part of more broadly reinforcing security, which we see as important to reinforcing deterrence, making sure that there's an understanding that there will be consequences for actions that are fundamentally destabilizing and which, you know, violate territorial integrity and sovereignty. Uh, so th for us, this is part of what we're trying to do. Part of this is working more closely with Japan, working more closely with Australia and with India, through it's both bilaterally through the Quad, but also working more closely with the ROK. I think if you look closely at what we uh, did following the uh, uh, ROK president's visit, you saw a joint statement which was actually quite different, much lengthier in and much more detailed than some of the ones we've done before, exactly because it covered new areas, which we thought were very important. So one of those is technology, finding ways to improve cooperation on technology, making clear that you know developing technology standards is something that's going to be critical to the future competition, and that we want to work with our partners to do that. For other things are working more closely with ASEAN, uh, recognizing that we have very much have an interest in a strong partnership with ASEAN. And I think we've seen one of the critical things with ASEAN is the engagement and the consequences of not showing up can be actually pretty significant. And so one of the things that we're doing, as you mentioned, is we will be looking to hold an uh, ASEAN summit in Washington. Uh, and I think that we will look for other ways in which we can signal in a meaningful way both our desire to have strong bilateral relationships with key partners in Southeast Asia, as well as two allies, um, as well as strengthening our relationship with the region. And I think finding ways to work with India, not just bilaterally, not just on South Asia, but also strengthening our cooperation with India, both through quad mechanism and outside the quad mechanism, on issues in Southeast Asia, on issues in the Pacific. So I think all those things reinforce each other. But I think that it's also critical to work with our European allies and partners uh, that has been one of the things that we've been gratified by is seeing how much they are interested in doing this. I think that what's happened in Ukraine will no doubt be a bit of a distraction for them. I mean, there's no question that their focus is very close to home, but I think it does reinforce the broader point about working in a situation where you're dealing with authoritarian regimes that no longer will feel constrained by the same rules 
on behavior and norms that we've seen in recent years. And I think in that sense, what we've seen in Ukraine marks a very fundamental shift and showing that we and others can help marshal an effective global response is critical, and also showing unity in the United States. I think that, you know, there's no question, I agree completely with General McMaster, that you know, Putin was counting on disunity um, in the United States, that there are some Americans who would put, you know, sir, would put Putin ahead of their country. And I think that that's something that showing that that's not the case is really, really critical for us. Um, and that's something that also reassures our Indo-Pacific partners that when they look at the unity that they're seeing inside the United States, they're seeing outside the United States, I think that helps strengthen the, the case for deterrence. And you know, ultimately, for deterrence to be most effective, we want there to be capability, but we also, as General McMaster said, we want there to be confidence in the will. And I think that what people are seeing is that there is a will to defend an international order that has brought tremendous benefits for many countries and that is very much part and parcel of the Indo-Pacific strategy that the administration has rolled out to try and help marshal that in a way that is most effective to reinforce the determination of countries to stand up to defend that order. And one of the things that we've made clear is that this is about partnership, it's about alliances, the, tr the traditional sort of hub and spoke model is no longer as valid. We are looking for partnerships that cross between countries and regions in ways that we haven't done before. And we think that those steps that have been taken so far, building on what previous administrations have done, are very important. But that there's tremendous potential to do more, and that potential is reinforced by Ukraine and also the China-Russia partnership. Terrific. I wonder if we can turn back to HR and talk a bit about Japan, Korea, our key allies in Northeast Asia. We think about Japan's frontline role here on the East China Sea, thinking about the North Korea threat, uh, thinking about Taiwan contingencies, and also South Korea having to stare down a, a growing arsenal there in North Korea in a critical election coming up in a few days. HR, how do you think about uh, Japan and Korea in the context of a, a U.S. policy and the continuity of U.S. policy uh, aiming for free and open Indo-Pacific. Well, here, uh, just to bring it back to the discussion we had as well, it's really important that Russia fails in Ukraine to, to bolster security across the Indo-Pacific vis-a-vis Taiwan, which we've already talked about, but also in Northeast Asia. And I think we uh, other lessons we can learn from Ukraine, I think, uh, you know, apply to Northeast Asia as well, right? And, and a lot of this has to do with just hard military capabilities. The Ukrainians, were, we did not help them enough to build up defense capabilities, hard defense capabilities, to convince the Russians that the Russians could not accomplish their objectives to the use of force. And Edgar, hey, I, I'm all, all for the Coast Guard operating in the Indo-Pacific, but don't bring a knife to a gunfight. And I think what we're learning as well is that we need much greater investment in, in defense, in, in, in capacity and capability across our armed forces. And again, I think it goes back to the lesson we talked about already, which we can't look at these theaters or potential theaters in, in isolation from one another again, right? Because of the, the degree to which we can see simultaneity of crises potentially happening. And the other, the other, and from Ukraine, um, other than, you know, that Russia was able to turn the Black Sea into a, into a Russian lake, essentially, uh, at, at, as part of the isolation and the need to have military capabilities to, to deny control of airspace and how critical that is in Northeast Asia. But how about from an energy security perspective and the economic dimension of the competition uh, it, across the Indo-Pacific and in Northeast Asia in, in particular? Uh, really giving Russia coercive power over... Uh, over over Germany's economy, Europe's economy was a big mistake. So now we need an energy policy, uh, and and you know that's tied to a climate and a CO two policy that is a real policy that makes sense instead of these non solutions we keep putting forward that deny, for example, investment in infrastructure essential for cheap natural gas to be available to get off of coal, uh, and and an emphasis on on other sources of of, of energy. You know, such as next generation nuclear and so forth. So I do do think some of the strategic lessons from Ukraine apply to Northeast Asia as well. And then, of course, I, I'm really glad to see the administration working on the relationship between Japan and and uh, and South Korea as part as part of the effort to uh, to make sure that any any provocation by the North should be seen as driving us closer together. 
And then I think what else we learn from from uh, from from Ukraine that relates to, to North Korea is, hey, China's not going to help us on North Korea. Let's just forget it, right? I mean, this is this is the way that China is now portraying itself as a peacemaker, like calling on all sides on Ukraine after uh, they essentially uh, after Xi Jinping essentially told Putin, hey, I'll do anything that I can to support you. So I do think that. There are some big lessons from Ukraine that we're learning that apply to security in the Indo-Pacific and in Northeast Asia in particular. And those are in the areas of defense, uh, d- d- you know, d- improving SDF, South Korean and U.S. defense, real hard defense capabilities to convince uh, China, Russia and North Korea they can't accomplish objectives in that region by the, for the use of force. There are, and they're very important, I think, energy security and economic lessons. And in fact, you know, we are overexposed to dependence on China uh, for criti- for critical supply chains. And what we don't want to do is create the kind of energy dependence on China associated with renewables and battery manufacturing and rare earths and magnet manufacturing uh, that Germany had uh, on, on, on Russia. So there's a lot of work to do in, in those areas uh, in terms of long-term security and, and defense capabilities. I think we're just underinvested in defense in the United States uh, and, and, uh, and I think may, hopefully Ukraine uh, w- was a wake-up call uh, for that as well. Well, let's turn to Bonnie and ask whether Taiwan is ready for uh, sort of stepped-up pressure against it. And can it deter China going forward? They've had some very senior visitors, former Secretary of State, a uh, high-level bipartisan delegation in Taiwan this week. President Tsai Ing-wen saying Taiwan is committed to defense, but is it fully committed? Is it spending enough? Um, and what else can we provide to Taiwan? How do you view the deterrence issue across the Taiwan Strait, Bonnie? Sure. So I, I think the problems that Taiwan had or the threats that Taiwan had were already there and growing prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And um, what I'm not sure is what additional impact the Ukraine conflict had, because if as I look at how the Rus- Russia has advanced in Ukraine, or in some cases, the difficulty Russia has faced in Ukraine, hopefully there are some lessons learned that, Ty- that China takes from Ukraine that actually discourages it from uh, thinking that invading Taiwan will be easy. So we had talked about the um, international unity and support to Ukraine, right? Hopefully China sees that in the context of thinking about any Taiwan invasion. I think it's also important to point out that we sh- we're seeing re- reports about uh, Russia suffering logistics challenges. We're seeing reports about the morale among the Russian military. And when you think about uh, a Russian invasion of Ukraine versus a Chinese inv- amphibious invasion of Taiwan, the invasion of Taiwan is just much more difficult given the Taiwan Strait and the geography. So if there are any lessons learned China should take about Russia's invasion of Ukraine is that it will be much more harder for China, for Taiwan. And in terms of the PLA capabilities, the PLA does not have nearly as much military experience as the Russian capability, Russian military. So the PLA should, one of the takeaways from Ukraine should be for the PLA to think twice about invasion of Taiwan. But having said that, I think there's still a lot that the Taiwan people could learn from Ukraine in terms of civil defense, in terms of stepping up and what they can do domestically for their capabilities. Uh, I think the United States is already doing quite a bit, not only bilaterally with Taiwan, but also with some of our key allies and partners like Japan, but also increasingly thinking about what Australia could do, what UK could do, what other like-minded countries can do. But at the end of the day, I think the Taiwan people need to do more and they should be learning from the significant resistance that Ukrainian people are posing for Russia. Lisa, I know you're going to be heading to the Philippines here shortly, and you've got a big uh, bipartisan study that's underway. Um, You can't anticipate that trip, but they've got a critical election coming in the Philippines. You're thinking about our key ally in Southeast Asia, um, the South China Sea. uh, It's been quiet relative to what we're seeing now in Ukraine and the concern about Taiwan. But how are you looking at um, the U.S. policy commitment to Southeast Asia? And then I'm going to go back to Edgar and hopefully... Uh, get a reaction to him from him again about um, both the economic component of that, the Indo-Pacific economic framework, as well as just a, a reassurance on our commitment to uh, deterrence throughout the Indo-Pacific. But but first uh, to you, Lisa. Yeah, so building on existing security arrangements that we have in the region uh, should be part of uh, our long-term strategy for competing with China, for promoting stability, Uh, and deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. 
And one of our longest standing um, alliances is with the Philippines. Uh, in fact, just last August, uh, we um, marked uh, the 70th anniversary of our mutual defense treaty uh, signed in 1951. Now, uh, the other important thing that happened uh, last year, last summer, was that uh, finally the uh, Philippines agreed to sort of reinstate and end the abrogation process of the Visiting Forces Agreement, which is an important agreement um, uh, establishing the, the um uh, the environment and the rules for our U.S. forces. So this removed a major irritant that had been created during the Duterte regime. Um, so, you know, because of the Philippine strategic location, uh, the ability for the U.S. to be able to position forces, um, have assets within the country, really has direct implications for what we're going to be able to do to deter China and promote stability uh, in the South China Sea. Um, and I would say that Duterte's sort of attempted realignment toward China uh, really failed. And in, in fact, I think it backfired on him. Um, the public uh, did not buy into it. Uh, his own senior advisors uh, were not supportive. Uh, so, you know, I do think that we um, have some real opportunities with the election of a new leader in the Philippines. I'm not saying that uh, it will be all smooth sailing. Uh, there are still historical grievances in our relationship, no matter who is elected. And it's still going to take a lot of effort for the U.S. to nurture the relationship and, uh, you know, in, enhance the alliance. Um, so even though I think Duterte's departure will uh, mark a positive change for our relationship, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be uh, easy or, or roses. Um, so moving forward, I think you know there are a few things the U.S. can do with uh, the Philippines. We can um, sort of recommit to the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement that was signed in 2014. Uh, this agreement has, uh, allows for increased rotational presence of the U.S. military uh, ships and aircraft, uh, allows for pre-positioning of uh, defense supplies. So this is something that we should be expanding and building upon. Um, and there have also been some calls for the U.S. to be more explicit in um, how we view the Philippines' claims in Scarborough Shoal, similar to the, uh, the primacy that we have given Japan's claims in the Senkaku. So I think there are many things we can do to nurture that security partnership with the Philippines uh, that will uh, pay off in terms of our overall strategy in the Indo-Pacific. Excellent. We're, we're running down on time here. Edgar, I want to go back to you. And I think, again, just the, um, on Southeast Asia, you've served in, in KL, for instance, not long ago. I remember seeing you in the embassy uh, in, in Malaysia. Um, but um, the Indo-Pacific economic framework that you've alluded to in the beginning that we've talked about and that Bonnie mentioned has not yet been detailed, it's still being essentially negotiated. Can, what can you say to reassure the region that the United States is going to continue to put muscle behind not only defense and deterrence, which I agree with in HR, we have to show toughness and strength right now, but that includes beating Putin. Um, but how do, we, how do we show that we're committed to the economic future of Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, the whole Indo-Pacific region, um, you know, how do we do this? And it, it's so difficult and it's, you know, it's out of, it's in the hands of lots of people, um, including USTR and many other officials in commerce who have to negotiate this. But what can you say that's reassuring about our economic posture here in uh, early 2022? So uh, a couple of things. I think one, I just want to piggyback on what Lisa said, just to emphasize the importance of the relationship with the Philippines, the progress that has been made. And I think, again, this is really as much a function of China um, and its behavior as anything else. And I think a recognition on the part of the government of the challenges of dealing with China. Uh, as well as the importance and broad popular support for the alliance with the United States. Uh, so I think that's going to be very important. I think that's, you know, we're looking at three very important elections 
um, coming up. But I don't think will completely change the landscape because I think that regardless of who wins in Korea, regardless of who wins in Australia, regardless of who wins in the Philippines, I think that there's very broad support for strong relationships with the U.S. But I think we also have to acknowledge that these are three very important allies um, and that there's you know, change that will be happening in this period of about three months. Um, so that's going to be something that I think we need to watch. I think we're in a relatively good position because there is such broad support for the relationship with the United States and broad support for an affirmative vision of how to engage with the region to defend their interests. But, you know, there, there will be change. I think that on the Indo-Pacific economic framework, I think the first thing is I think we just have to take a step back and recognize that despite some of the rhetoric surrounding RCEP, rhetoric surrounding TPP, the U.S. continues to be an extraordinarily important economic partner by every definition. So often there's a focus on good trading goods, and obviously China's risen dramatically in importance as a trade partner for virtually every country in the region. Um, but I think that if you look at the combination of trading goods, trading services, investment, people-to-people -people ties, the web of relationships and the degree to which the, the American companies and integration with the U.S. market continues to be extremely important for most of the major uh, economic players in the Indo-Pacific, I think that we should not let ourselves buy into the idea that somehow the U.S. isn't playing an important economic role. I think we are, and we continue to be very important. Now, at the same time, I think we have to acknowledge that there is very much a view that in Asia that and in the Indo-Pacific that trade is equal strategy, and strategy equals trade. I think that you need to have an economic approach if you want to have a successful strategy. We recognize that, we're working on it. I think the key elements will be this, that this will be something that will build on the desire for countries in the region to see an affirmative economic, U.S. economic role. It will also build on real concern in some key areas. Um, and I would note supply chains is one of them. I highlight what General Master said, I think the recognition that you know supply chains are already critical, but also nobody wants to find themselves Got buying into you know, inflexible supply chains that increase dependency um, in ways that create greater risk. And I think that what we've seen as a result of COVID is that separate from whatever the intention is, if your supply chains overwhelmingly center through one place and you're in an environment where there's you know, a pandemic, where there's likely to be more natural disasters, that that creates risk. And so I think that separate from whatever geostrategic issues there are, they're very obvious geostrategic issues. I think virtually every country in the region recognizes the risks of supply chains that aren't diversified. And I think that also what we've seen is every major country in the region wants to be part of a supply chain conversation with the United States. So I accompanied, um, I accompanied the Vice President to Singapore and Vietnam. I accompanied uh, Secretary Raimondo to Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, we have had extensive discussions in Japan and Korea with Australia and New Zealand, with Thailand, uh, with the Philippines. The one overarching theme is everybody wants to make sure that they are positioned to have serious supply chain discussions with the United States. Uh, and, and the same goes with India um, and with, with Bangladesh. Uh, they, they, so I think this is something that's of great interest. I think that there's also an interest in digital. Um, and I think that, you know, one thing is if you look closely, every single country in the region has seen a huge increase in digital uh, commerce and e-commerce as a result of COVID, as we've seen in our country. And so I think that there's even more of a recognition of the importance of working in these areas. I think that there's a recognition of the importance of working together on climate um, and the climate does, you know, adapting to climate change, but also dealing with climate change creates real opportunities. There's going to be some very fundamental shifts and that the way in which this is done is very important, taking General Master's point, um, but that th this is going to happen and that if we can find ways to harness our common interests and common efforts, that can be very powerful. So I don't want to get ahead of ourselves in terms of what the details are. Obviously, you understand these, you know, as much as sensitive as any international discussions are, very few are as sensitive as things in the economic sphere because they tend to have very real domestic political impacts for all the players. Um, but I think that you will see 
in the coming, you know, coming, you know, relatively short period, you will see more detail coming out. But I think we'll address that. I think that it will inevitably there will be critics. Some people say it's too much. Some people say it's too little. And the one thing, and I, General Master and Lisa know this well. One thing you can be certain of in this role is, and you know it as well, uh, Patrick and, and Bonnie, is that no shortage of critics. Um, but. I think that what we are trying to do is make sure that we are addressing what we have heard as the core desires of the countries that we deal with, that what the region is looking for to be more confident of a sustained and long-term U.S. engagement. And I think that inevitably it will also evolve over time. And so I feel very confident. I think when you look at our strengths, they are quite significant. Yes. In relative terms, China has is playing a much bigger role, but and, and the way in which they're doing it is very different, and I think very worrying to many countries. But I think the strengths of the U.S. and our allies and our partners are still extraordinary, and I think that when we see them come together for something that is like Ukraine, that sends a very powerful signal. And so I remain very optimistic about where the United States is going in the region. I remain very optimistic about our ability to engage successfully. I remain very optimistic about our ability to make, to build, maintain, and sustain bipartisan support um, and make sure that we're working very closely with Congress as we do this, that there is coordination between different parts of our government, and it will never be perfect. And I'm the first to admit that. Um, and, you know, we will always be surprised by things that pop up. But I do believe that we are building on what previous administrations have done to really move in the direction that reflects the importance of the Indo-Pacific, the fact that it is linked to other areas and that we can't compartmentalize completely. And that together, we are stronger, and I think that is reassuring to every country, or to or virtually every country. I would say, you know, we've been criticized by the Chinese who said that uh, the Global Times said the Indo-Pacific strategy was crafty, um, and, you know, so, and the North Koreans probably not big fans either, but I would say that in general, countries have welcomed this because they realize this is a sign of U.S. engagement and a form of U.S. engagement. Now the challenge is, can we follow through? And to do that, we need the support of the people on this call. We need people calling us out when we're not doing as good a job as we should. But we also need people working together to maintain the support that we have, make the case for why this matters, and that we are really strong when we're working together. So with that, I hate to do this. I'm going to have to run. I think it's probably safer. Everyone can trash me and trash the administration um, more easily once I leave. But I really want to thank you, Patrick. Um, and I want to thank the panelists. It's so great to see you. And you know, to say this has been a great discussion and look forward to more of these. And that you, know, you are our partners as we work to implement this strategy. And we really look forward to your feedback and your guidance. Thank you. Right. I just want to thank you so much for your time, for your insights, for the entire team over there that you're working with um, uh, uh, inside the NSC and across the administration. I know how difficult this is and um, how, and, and you're absolutely right. The confidence is exuding, uh, follow through is all critical. You're getting constructive advice and constructive criticism here uh, and elsewhere, but uh, we're all on the same team on this, on this strategy. So good luck to you. Thank you again. Absolutely. We're all rooting for you. And thanks again, Eckhart. And, and great job on getting the strategy out and, and thanks for everything you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we're going to end it right there. Thank you so much, all. <laughs>